Hi everyone, hope you're all well. Bernard here with the latest from the Citizen Channel and we're going back to a city pass today so it's a, a Moments in Time magazine feature and it's uh, a look at a certain gentleman who came to us uh, in the 70s, so I'm going back to the 70s uh, for a fee of uh, somewhere between 160 to 200,000 and he left us uh, in December 1977, he came to us Obviously, in 1974. Well, you don't know that yet because I've not told you it is. So, he came to us in 1974. Yeah, we're talking today about uh, Mr. Joseph Royal, or better known as Joe Royal. Please, if you're new to the channel, push that subscribe button, push the bell notifications so you know these vlogs are coming out. And uh, please, thumbs up are always great. It's, it's great to get views and, and comments, etc. But uh, if you can't, if you don't want to leave a comment, just because a thumbs up is fantastic. It's so it's just great. I really enjoy doing these, but it's nice to know you're out there and uh, hope you enjoy what we've got today. If you this is part one of this uh, look at Joe Royal, it'll be uh, I can't do it all in one go, it'll be too too long. So this is just part one of our look at uh, Mr. Joe Royal. Yeah, he left City on the 15th of December 1977 to join Bristol City at the time, the other, another city, uh, after an initial period of being on loan there. But he'd made his debut for City almost three years earlier. Um, it cost anywhere between the estimates, anywhere between £160,000 to £200,000, depending on which paper you read and who you believed. Uh, so he joined us... Um, and it was a uh, baptism of fire for him, actually, when he made his uh, first debut for City. He actually made his, his debut uh, as an ex-Evertonian. He made his first debut for City at Anfield, believe it or not, um, on the 26th of December 1974. I mean, we were title challengers that year, as we were usually in the mid-70s. And we sat fourth at the halfway point of the season, uh, just a point behind leaders. Yes, Everton were the leaders at the time. Uh, Everton were the leaders. And only behind Liverpool, who was sat in second. We're only behind Liverpool on the, on the, on goal difference. We actually had the same points as Liverpool. So it was a really big game. So, I mean, how, how well did his sort of debut work out? Well, it didn't, didn't work out very, very well, to be honest with you. Uh, <laughs> he's actually remembered his debut, uh, Joe Royal. In a match programme on the 4th of April 1983, when we played Liverpool at Main Road, he actually looks back on his debut that day. He obviously wasn't with City at that time, but obviously he wrote on his debut days as a feature in the programme. So I'm just going to read read that a little bit of that to you now. Ask a footballer to choose an ideal launching pad for a new club career, and a few would nominate Liverpool to provide the opposition for their debut. Certainly none would select a trip to the Lions' lair at Anfield as the ideal setting for a fresh start, and that would apply doubly so for the ex-Evertonian. So Joe Royal had his work cut out on his first appearance for Manchester City, and it could scarcely be called the best Christmas present he'd ever had when his name went down for the number nine shirt in the Blues lineup that visited Liverpool on Boxing Day 1974. Joe had arrived unheralded on the City staff only 48 hours before. The lack of publicity about the £200,000 signing, see this is where they differ, someone says 160, uh, being due to the lateness of the deal on Christmas Eve and the absence of any newspapers on the main two days for the holiday period. Not like the internet now when, when you get to know everything straight away. He joined a City side lying hard handily in the first division after a goalless game at Wolves five days earlier had dropped them Three places in the table, yeah. So they'd actually literally just moved down to six uh, three days before this game. They had, they had been in third and fourth position, so they had moved down a little bit before this. But need to have an eye on the rebuilding as Mike Summerby's career at their top was just about over. And Rodney Marsh was continuing to prove extravagantly unpredictable. Since strikers have been getting short shrift from trips to Merseyside for a long time, Joe knew what to expect against the Anfield Aces. He'd been put to the test plenty of times in an extensive career with Everton, during which he won the first of his six full England caps. At least Joe had proved that he knew where the net would be at Anfield. He'd scored there for Everton in a 3-2 defeat on November the 21st, 1970. But on this occasion, he drew a blank and the Reds were rampant. They fired in goals through Brian Hall, scored two John Toshak and Steve Highway. They held a 3-0 lead as the interval 
to thrill the majority of the 46,000 crowd and keep them top of the league with a better goal average than second place Middlesbrough. There you go, so Middlesbrough are actually up there as well. City's consolation came from Colin Belly's 10th scoring effort of the season. Not the kind of game to leave many memories, especially for a debutant. That's true. I remember a little about it, said Joe, who is now manager at Oldham. His first year in the boss's chair, I call the rush that it was being signed on Christmas Eve and going into the team without actually getting a training session with my new Met team. I could have scored in the first 10 minutes before Liverpool took a grip of the game. I hit my shot well enough, but it went the wrong side of the post. So there you go. That was a bit about his debut, um, Joe Royal. So it wasn't great, was it, a 4-1 mm. defeat against Liverpool and Anfield? But again, hey, well, you know, there's been a few of those, haven't there, over time. He would actually make his main road debut in front of the City fans just a, a couple of days later, two days later, home game. Um, yeah, with Derby County, we're sort of lying mid-table at that time. I mean, don't forget what year this is, 74-75. They were lying mid-table, Derby, although there wasn't much many points. In, I mean, from top to about mid-table, it was about four or five points. That was, the, that was the only difference. It was a really tight season, really tight league. So this was seemingly, on the face of it, an easier task for the City, but... Uh, Unfortunately, Joe played. I mean, I was I was I was unable to go that day. Uh, for, I was only I was only a kid at school. I probably couldn't afford it for whatever reason, or I couldn't get a ticket. I can't remember now what what the problem. I used to pay at the game most of the time. I don't think it was an old ticket game. It was a big crowd. Uh, but yeah, we suffered another defeat in front of a crowd of over forty thousand, uh, losing two one. Which. Uh, on reflection, if you look back, uh, it wasn't bad really because Derby would actually go on and win the league that year, even though they were sat mid table. So we did all right, and they had a certain Francis Lee in the ranks, didn't they? And of course, this game was immortalised on BBC Match of the Day as uh, and Mr. Barry Davies helped immortalise it, obviously, because Francis Lee, as you'd expect, did score. And obviously, one of his uh, commentate, well, as, as he was commentating, as Francis Lee went to shoot, he said, "Interesting." He said, as Lee unleashed his shot, he said, "Very interesting." He added, as it screamed into the top corner, and then obviously, if Mr. Lee, you know, not not one to hide under a bushel, didn't hold back his delight, and obviously, a big beaming smile and stood there. I mean, it now haunts us still, doesn't it? But uh, you can watch that game again you can still watch the highlights of it if you want as well so i might even pin i might even put them on the link so please check that out and he just went on to say mr davis oh look at his face just look at his face and that became one of the certainly before the aguero moment one of the, perhaps the most uh, significant city bylines or catchphrases that we've seen over the years um, yeah, so he featured in that, so it wasn't great, was it? 4-1 defeat to Liverpool, 2-1 defeat at home to Derby. He wasn't, wasn't doing very well, was he? He, did, he didn't feature in yet another defeat for City because he'd signed too late to play in the FA Cup third round on the 4th of January in 1975 uh, against Newcastle, of which he was ineligible, being signed too late to qualify. Uh, Tony Buck told the fans the re reasons for signing Joe in his match notes uh, for this programme. So if you look at his natural, it's the reason for my Christmas signing, this is what Tony Buck said for about signing Joe Rowe. Because don't forget, these these things, as I said, there wasn't much press. And uh, obviously the, the City programmes, they were always having to go to print two or three weeks before. So City fans hadn't really heard from Tony Buck about uh, why he'd signed him in, in the match programme. So Tony Buck, manager of Manchester City, the reason for my Christmas signing. Our urgent need for strengthening the attack with a player of established ability has, I'm quite sure, been solved by the Christmas signing of Joe Royal from Everton. Although it will take another month before we can appreciate the real value of our new centre forward because of the need to sharpen him up to the pace of first division football once more. I consider the investment to be an excellent deal for this City team. Since when Davis was sold to United a few seasons back, I have always held the opinion I've been short of strength up front and have required a substantial target man. We have had the superior skills of players like Rodney Marsh and Mike Summerbait and Dennis Stewart too over the past year, but we have not had the type of spearhead that these players can feed off. I feel Joe Royal will fill the bill for many years to come. I made a couple of inquiries to Everton early in the season, but I resisted the temptation to rush into the deal because I wanted to give our own Barney Daniels a serious first-team test. This opportunity was displayed because of a cartilage operation which Barney underwent in the early part of the season. But my conclusion, which I've been influenced by its wide-open aspects of the title race this season, was that the team needs an experienced striker immediately. At this stage, it's not the most opportune time to be nursing players for a long period while they acquire that experience and I think it's generally accepted that tuning to such a key role as a main striker is not an overnight 
process. It takes a long time. The spice of extra competition will also sharpen the battle for places and make players like Barney Daniels fight much harder to gain their recognition. It's a move we have to make in our present circumstances. Judgment on my decision has to be reserved at the, this point because Joe will need a short settling in period. He's been involved in Central League soccer in recent months after starting the season in Everton's team. And this has clearly taken the edge from his ability. Yeah, so he wasn't getting in the first team at Everton at the time. It is a far easier for an established player to lose his sharpness when relegated to reserve football than it is for a regular reserve to lose touch with the pace of play. A player accustomed to the atmosphere of the first division games can find his enthusiasm slackening rapidly when asked to play in front of central league attendances. This is a big come down, particularly for a player like Joe, who has been of international ranking in recent years. We have worked with Joe very hard this week, having the opportunity because he was cup tied for this afternoon's tie with Newcastle, ineligible. Already I have sensed the improvement. There were times in last Saturday's match against Derby when we tried to play sharp one-two moves around the penalty box, which would have carried us through the pat defence. Luck was not on our side because they broke down, but these are the kind of penetrating ideas we need to develop to break down those teams who come to Main Road with a rear guard, rear guard, rear guard action. So there you go, that was uh, Tony, Tony Buck's views. Obviously, for, for signing uh, Joe Royal, who, who did raise a few eyebrows, as I said, because he's sort of uh, not been featuring in, in Everton's team at the time. I mean, personally, as I think I mentioned there, I didn't, I didn't get to Liverpool. I mean, obviously, I was at school at the time, so I couldn't afford many games. So I hadn't, didn't get to Liverpool to see him. I didn't get to that Derby game. And I say, I do remember being in my friend's uh, back garden in Withington, listening to the crowd noises. And uh, I thought City had won the crowd noises with that loud, the cheers, etc. Obviously, I was devastated to find we'd lost. But my first sight of Joe Royal, I went a trip to Bramall. I did get to Bramall Lane to watch, uh, which was the old cricket ground then. So it was uh, quite an unusual usual jump. Uh, so that was my first sight on the 11th of January 1975, a 1-1 draw. And uh, Colin Bell had actually appeared to score a very a score a very late winner, but again, these nasty referees and Mr Kirkpatrick uh, disallowed the goal, apparently um, an infringement by Joe Royal in the box that no one quite spotted and Joe never admitted to anything, but obviously us, the fans, didn't see anything and uh, we were all left a little bit puzzled by that, but obviously Kirkpatrick had seen something, so... We did actually, in theory, almost win that game, but uh, obviously something Joe Royal had done. So it wasn't the greatest start again, was it? But at least we'd had a point. At least Joe Royal had been in a team that had a point. And he'd finally get his first win in a City shirt. Uh, and we'd played Newcastle in the FA Cup, of course, but we'd finally get his win against Newcastle in the league with a 5-1 win on the 18th of January, which uh, included a Dennis Stewart hat-trick, although Royal didn't score himself. In fact, he had to wait uh, seven games in total uh, before he got he got one off the mark, one of his goals in front uh, got. He had to wait. Sorry, he had to wait seven games before he got off the mark on the goals from almost two months, and he scored on February the twenty second, nineteen seventy five, his debut goal in the three one win over Birmingham City. Uh, the other scores. Uh, that, that that day that were uh, Bell and Chewett in front of a thirty three thousand two hundred and forty crowd, but that sadly was going to be the. The last goal for the rest for the rest of the season. Uh, many many fans had sort of said and were a bit worried about him coming from Everton reserves. And many fans were saying he'd lost his scoring touch and City would finish, would sadly finish only finish eighth that season. And it would be a little bit of a disappointment with uh, some early promise. So uh, we weren't totally enamoured by Mister Joro. Things things weren't going superbly at the time. So then. The next season, well, things sort of changed. Uh, from November, uh, Joe Roy would be an, a more or less an ever-present. So from November 1975, he would, he would be actually in the team every week. And, of course, he started to score regularly. Of course, he played a major part in our triumphant League Cup win on February 28th, 1976. Again, against a certain Newcastle United so obviously with his goals he was scoring, he got a, a brace against Newcastle again on the 30th of August 1975. And uh, although not prolific, he was always a, a menace in the box and did have many, we didn't keep count of him these, those days like we do now. He had many assists in the box, etc. But obviously uh, we can't come up with the figures for them because no one seemed to bother doing them in those days. They weren't really called assists, that's a new, a new thing, obviously. Uh, goals against United, of course, would always end dear City, City players 
cheers to, to the City fans and he scored in a 2-2 draw on the 27th of September at Main Road. And of course he scored again against United in the fourth round of the League Cup, uh, a 4-0 win on November the 12th, which uh, sadly would be more remembered for the Colin Bell incident, the injury to Colin Bell, which 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 actually put ended his career even though we know he did make his comebacks but that literally put an end to his City and England career at that stage. Uh, by December the 6th after a good 4-0 away win versus Wolves uh, Tony Buck was gushing about Mr Royal. He was he was absolutely enthralled. And he did so he commented in his program notes of uh, for that game uh, Tony Buck talking and this is what he said about uh, Joe Royal. The performances of Joe Royal at Wolves last Saturday smacked of that good old-fashioned attacking leadership upon which so many successful forward lines rely for their dividends in the days before blanket defences tried to smother the excitement and interest in soccer. We reaped a rich reward, four goals, which extended our unbeaten run to 14 games. The team has been bubbling with confidence for a long time now, each encouraging result, sharpening the appetite, and expected some teams were going to cop it. But one feature which has emerged during our recent run has been the contribution from our central striker, Joe, who has clearly put behind him all the difficulties he encountered after signing for us shortly before Christmas last year. Joe joined us in the belief that he could take on a new lease of life, but there were no instant miracles, and he was subscribed to a lot of pressures in the first half of this year because the goals did not flow as freely as everyone expected. He left the lad in the doldrums as he became acutely aware of his thin return, one goal from 16 league appearances. Those are the kind of pressures which do no good at all to a centre forward who knows that he is judged on the scoring goods he delivers. It's such a different story this winter as goals have been arriving both in the league and the League Cup and now it's obvious we are seeing the Joe Royal we were always commanded respect from defences and was a penalty box terror to goalkeepers. So there, yet yeah, Joe Royal shaded the honours with a powerful brand of leadership around which the whole performance pivoted. He laid off the ball with great dexterity, feeding passes back into midfield and spreading a sweet service out to the wingers. He is enjoying the responsibility of playing against twin centre halves by himself. When he was playing with another strike alongside, there were many occasions when he was looking for his partner to take the initiative and Joe was content to play as a striker when his power would have been better utilised as a main target man. Now he knows... He's the only man in the middle who matters. And that has to be directly involved every time his teammates are seeking a route into the centre. He accepts he's got to try and make contact with every ball that's played up through the middle. And this has not only increased his involvement, but has also given him a sense of responsibility to which he's responding quite magnificently. Yeah, so he goes on to carry on with more gushing things about Joe. But it just shows the difference, isn't it, from struggling that first half season to all of a sudden he be, he be becoming a, a, a linchpin in uh, in City's games. I mean, uh, of course, Joe himself was, was sort of buzzing after that and he would he would later say it was a game against West Ham on the 17th of January 76 that uh, was his best best game. He scored two in that one in the 3-0 win. And soon after, he scored one of the goals, of course, in a... In a League Cup semi-final win, don't we? But uh, there's going to be more of that in uh, part in part two of this look at Joe Royal. So we're going to talk about uh, hey, he's reached reaching his pinnacle now, isn't he? Is uh, there's only one way he can go in at the top, though, isn't there? And that's down. So uh, please join me for part two of this look, uh, citizen moments in time. Look at Joe Royal. Please check my links on screen. Uh, if you follow me on. Friend me on Facebook or Twitter. I do check every couple of days and follow and friend everyone back. And I do put lots of stuff on there. And you can check my website, moviegainnostalgia.com for old rare DVDs, movie posters from the 1990s and 2000s board games. That's my little day job. If you can have a check from that site, that would be fantastic. And if you do check the playlist, you'll see I do um, a movie and TV drama vlogs as well, uh, reviews, etc. So if you're any interested in that or know someone who could be interested, please point them in my direction. I will be very, very grateful. Anyway, thanks for that. Let me know in the comments if you remember any what you remember about Joe Royal. Please join me for part two of this uh, look back at uh, Mr. Royal's influence on on Manchester City as a player. Anyway, obviously there'll be uh, obviously he goes on to do other things for us as well, doesn't he? But thanks for watching today. What are we going to do this today? Look after yourselves. Look after your friends. Look after your families. More importantly, let's all look after each other. Until we meet again on another Citizen Channel vlog, either past or present. This is Bernard saying, please stay safe, Blues. See you all again soon. Thanks for watching. Bye-bye.